good to be in camp meeting again this morning. Yes. Amen. Haven't we been sitting in some heavenly places around here this week? Yes, sir. I tell you, last night uh, the Word of God was so incredibly rich. I remarked to my wife uh, yesterday evening after service, you know, it seems like Pentecost as a whole has shifted away from preaching about the cross. And we, we love to talk about the blessings of God and serving God. And that's my favorite thing to preach about. But what we heard preached last night is where we're all living, isn't it? And thank you, Brother Copeland, for the ministry of the Word of God. So good. And it's good to be here. Good to be around the people of God here in this uh, camp meeting and I want to uh, just take a moment to say how much I appreciate all of the good cooking that's been going on over in the cafeteria. I tell you ladies forevermore know how to cook and put it on and do it with style. And I've, I've noticed uh, several occasions this week how there's such a spirit of servitude that works in this church. And everybody seems to be so happy about being together and working for God and serving and putting this on. And I commend this congregation for uh, the beautiful spirit that, that just encapsulates everything that's going on here. I also want to say thank you for the uh, wonderful accommodations. They put us up in a bed and breakfast right down the road. And uh, we got in our room. We had a big basket of goodies there. And not only did we have a basket of goodies, but we had a bouquet of flowers that had been prepared for us. And I got to thinking, you know, I've preached around the country a few times, and uh, there have been a few occasions that I've walked into a hotel room and a church would furnish a bouquet of flowers as a welcome token. I've been to a number of places where they provide a gift basket, but this is the first time and the first place I've ever went anywhere and got both flowers and a basket. And uh, so you all take hospitality to a whole new level, and uh, thank you for it. Amen. Well, I want to preach from the Word of God tonight, or today, and uh, I want to take my time and preach something that uh, is a passion of mine. I have in my spirit and I have felt for this meeting. Thank you, Brother and Sister McKillop, for the liberty to be able to minister the Word of God here. Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, and then we'll read verse number 8. Daniel chapter 1, and verse number 3. And the king spake unto Ash. Panaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the king children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science. And such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So this king is taking from the captives of Israel the best and the brightest of the young there. He sifts through them. History tells us they're between 15 and 17 years old at this point, these captives, and these are special young people. Verse 5 says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And dropping down to verse number 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. 
And from this reading, I want to teach a little while this morning from this question. What shall we do when we sit at the king's table? What shall we do when we sit at the king's table? Shake your neighbor's hand and tell him you can sit down, but please don't sit on the preaching. Y'all are going to love me for this, but pardon me, is there someone that could possibly turn this air conditioner off or down? Uh, it's uh, it's going to strip my vocal cords here in short order, and uh, I got a lot of stuff to say tonight, day, and <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> The book of Daniel starts out by recording the uh, sad occasion in which Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, invades uh, Jerusalem, and they, they, they go there and they capture several hundred of the young men that live there, uh, God-fearing, one God Jewish, devout, talented young men. And they bring these uh, men back. They're between 15 and 17 to 20 years old, somewhere in that age range. And he got the very best of the best. Uh, his Nebuchadnezzar's men had been instructed to look for those young men that had a presence about them. They carried themselves in a way that uh, spoke of men that were able to uh, stand in a palace. You know, you, you, can just, you can just tell somebody's class sometimes by just looking at them. There's something about a person's deportment, the way they stand, the confidence that is in their face, the, uh, the way they uh, arrange their clothes and uh, when you watch a person walk, some people just have a certain bearing about them that makes them stand out from a crowd. And this was what they were looking for in these Jewish young men. They found the ones that had the best minds, that understood science, that, that were well spoken. And the reason that Nebuchadnezzar wanted these best of class young men from Jerusalem is he wanted to bring them back into Babylon. And he wanted to immerse them in Babylonian culture. And he wanted to turn their minds and their hearts away from their upbringing and ultimately use their skills and their talents in order to expand and develop the Babylonian empire. He wanted to do that. That was his goal. And so for three years, they were given a crash course in the language and the education system of the Chaldeans. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to put just as much of Babylon in their minds as he possibly could. He wanted to take these Jewish young men and and somehow caused them to forget everything they had been taught as children and, and give them a new world view to cause them to think like a Babylonian and no longer think like a Hebrew. And, 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 and in trying to get these young men to, to embrace the culture of Babylon, uh, he had a, had a problem because there was something in the spirits and in the character of these Hebrews that had a resistance towards Babylonian culture. Nebuchadnezzar was teaching. Uh, they were brainwashing. They were doing everything they could to get them to integrate in the Babylonian culture, but uh, but there's just something about Hebrew young people 
They don't like to go along with the flow. And so for the king to get these young men to break down the resistance, to embrace the culture of Babylon, he had to somehow get them to fall in love with Babylon. Somehow the king had to uh, get them to thinking that Babylon's really not so bad. And get them feeling comfortable there to where they didn't have a wall up towards the ungodly culture of Babylon. So, what the king did is he prepared a banquet hall. And he put on a feast day after day after day, week upon week, month upon month for three years. He wined them. And dine them, or so that was his mission to do it. And the king understood something that a lot of women have intuitively known for years, that the way to every man's heart is through his stomach. And Babylon's philosophy is if we can get them to eat our food and enjoy our banqueting hall, It'll only be a matter of time before we get them in our temples and they'll bow their knee to our gods. And so, on that first day, uh, they bring these young men into this large banquet hall. Now, I want to stress to you uh, the fact that these young men did not choose to be captives. I mean... uh, it had just been days before a foreign army had raided their town. and They were drug kicking and screaming out of their homes. And now they're here as captives. And for all practical intents and purposes, they're slaves. And, and they're forced to live in a society that they didn't create. And, and now they're forced to come into a banquet hall. That they didn't choose. And they're forced to sit down in front of food that they didn't cook. Circumstance and time had placed them in this position. Now, they sit there that first day. And if you will give me the liberty to use my imagination a little bit. I would imagine that the banquet hall in Babylon was a beautiful affair. I'm visualizing large ceilings that had specialty paints and perhaps murals painting on the ceiling. And then every so many feet uh, down through the hall, there were wall lights, sconces, and of course they would have been using oil of something to light the banquet hall. But I imagine the lighting in that dining hall was as such that it just set a, a warm, cozy atmosphere. And then we have these long tables down the hall, and there's the finest of tapestries on the table. And there is uh, silver candlesticks ever so often down through these uh, tables. And on the tables, there is a an assortment of food like these young men have never seen before in their life. There's piles of food and platters, the nicest of uh, of silver platters in China, and and there's fruit arrangements that it's not just fruit, but it's been decoratively placed there. And there's platters of meat and. Platters of all different kind of vegetables prepared every which way. And it is a feast fit for a king. These young men are poor young men. They've been raised in common backgrounds and they've never sat at anything like this. They've never seen such magnificence. So they come in and they sit down and it's time to eat. And Babylon was smart. Because you see, there are some foods that a, a Jew can eat according to their law, and there are some foods that are prohibited. 
And, you know, a Jew can't eat pork. Uh, they couldn't eat any fish that uh, fed off the bottom like catfish. And, uh, and, and so there was several things they couldn't eat there. But there was things that they could. They could not eat uh, any foods that had been prepared uh, that had dairy products and meat products uh, prepared together. And so they had these dietary laws that they had to observe as a matter of conviction to the Lord. And they're sitting at this table. And here comes the platters of food. And oh, they're so hungry. And the first platter was filet mignon. Cook medium rare. The only way to cook a steak. But it wasn't just filet mignon. It was a level up from that. It was bacon wrapped filet. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> and, uh, and so the platter comes down and, and they're so hungry and they look at the meat. But the problem is they can't eat the bacon, so, so they pass it on. Then here comes a platter of food. Here's a rack of lamb. Yeah, we can have that. Then there comes a platter of fried catfish. And if you ever get to heaven, they're going to have fried catfish in heaven. It is one of the most awesome foods. And, and, and oh, they've never smelled such a wonderful smell. That's what they're getting off that fried catfish. And here comes the ears of corn. And it's coming around the table. And, 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 and these young men are sitting at the table picking and choosing what they can eat. But you know what? Time was going on. And there was an agenda at the king's table. That's we've got to suck them in. We've got to lure them in. We've got to get them to defile their conscience a little bit with the food. Because if we can get them to defile their conscience here, the next day, the choices are a little harder because there's less and less kosher food. And, and one by one, these Babylonian or these Hebrew captives in Babylon start to rationalize. They're thinking, I didn't choose to be here. It's not that I wanted to be here at the table. But you know what? You got to eat to live. And God understands, surely, that we got to eat to live. And, and so uh, there came a day when one of them took one of those bacon wrapped filet mignons. And he cut into it, and oh, the warm, rich taste of bacon delighted his taste buds like in nothing he'd ever had. I'm going to tell you, ain't nothing better than bacon. Fried crisp in the morning. Every time you eat bacon, you need to say, thank God for Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad he fulfilled that old law, aren't you? And, uh, and man, it tastes so good. And, and then, well, if that was so good, what about a little catfish? And, and one by one, these young men started eating things they'd been taught not to eat. And their conscience one by one got defiled. But in the midst of it, the Bible tells us there are four young men. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That purpose in their heart that they would not defile themselves with the king's meat. Because you see this, this matter of doing what God said was more than just a preference for them. It was a matter of conviction. And their attitude was, we might have not have chose to live here. Circumstance may have placed it in front of our fingers but we don't have to eat it because we got a conviction. And 
I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, we've got to get some convictions in our heart. We've got to get this truth in our heart as a matter of conviction. It's got to be more than just a good idea. It's got to be more than just the way we raised. It was, it's got to be a matter of conviction to us. Back in the 1960s in the United States uh, Supreme Court, uh, there was a case that came before the uh, court involving religious freedom. And the case involved an Amish man. I'm just curious, uh, are there any Amish people up in this part of the world? Uh, some Everybody familiar with what Amish are and the Amish are? Man, they've got a lot of great values and so on. And, and part of the Amish um, way of life is they only send their kids to school until the eighth grade. This is a matter of religious uh, conviction to them. Uh, they, they, they don't believe in any higher education than that. And there was an Amish man named Jonas Yoder, and he lived in the state of Wisconsin. And, and this man took his girl out of school after the eighth grade, and he refused her to send her on to any higher education. Uh, he was reported to the state, and they had a mandatory attendance law in that state. And the state of Wisconsin said, you've got to send your girl to school. He said, well, I can't do that because my religion says I can't. They said in so many words, it doesn't matter what your religion says. If your religion says something different than the state, you've got to send her to school anyway. And so they took him to court, and, and the court went uh, to uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court. And eventually, in 1972, it was appealed all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And, and, and Jonas Yoder pleaded as his defense the First Amendment to our Constitution, which says that everybody has freedom to practice their religious belief. And so what the court had to decide was this. Which religious beliefs really are covered under the law and which of them are not covered? And so after much debate and Looking into the matter, the court finally determined this. They determined that every religious belief that there is falls under one of two categories. It's either a conviction or it's a preference. All of us have convictions, or we should, and all of us have things we do as preferences. And they further determined that the Constitution only protected religious convictions, but they did not protect religious preference. And so they had to decide, does this man believe what he believes about this uh, education as a conviction or a preference? And so here's how they describe the difference between the two. These are their words and not mine. They said... A preference is a strong belief. It is strong enough that we will devote our wealth, our time, and our effort to it. A preference is strong enough that we will even be willing to evangelize others in the name of it. However, under certain circumstances... Regardless of how strong your preference is, certain pressures will cause them to change. And the court outlined five things that would cause somebody to walk away from a religious preference. Number one is peer pressure. A lot of people will lay down what they believe when their peers no longer believe it. A lot of preachers quit preaching what they used to preach when their friends quit preaching it. So peer pressure calls you to walk away. Second thing that will cause someone to walk away from a religious preference is family pressure. And I might add there's no pressure like family pressure. You've got people in your own home that don't love God like you love God. And they're putting pressure on you. It, it'll cause you to change. 
Old Brother Terry made a remark years ago. He said, if for a preacher there's two times or three times when he, he'll change his beliefs, it's when he's get married, uh, when he has kids, and when he has grandkids. Those are the three testing points. See if you really believe what you believe. The third thing that will cause somebody to back up from a preference is fear of a lawsuit. If you get sued and taken to court, will you stop believing what you believe to pacify the court? The fourth thing that will cause somebody to compromise a preference is the threat of going to jail. And the fifth thing is the pressure of death. There are very few people that believe anything strong enough that they're willing to die for what they believe. And a preference under our law in the United States is not protected under religious freedom. However, the court said that there is another category of belief that falls under the name of conviction. And this is what they said. They said conviction is a belief so deep and so strong that it will not change regardless of circumstances because a man believes that his God requires it of him. A conviction is non-negotiable. And I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, if there's ever been an hour when, uh, when the church needs to get some conviction in our spirit, it's right now. Because you see, the deal is, Babylon has resurfaced. We're living in a Babylonian culture. You read the history of Babylon, what they was doing, it's everything that's happening now in North America. We didn't choose our world to get this bad. We did not make all the perversion and all the uh, filth of this world. We didn't do that. And here we're living in a world where we're surrounded by a different society. And just like Babylon then wanted to get the best and the brightest and turn them into Babylonians to further their agenda. I'll have you know there are spirits in our society right now that want to pick out the best and the brightest of the young people that's sitting in this campground and the enemy wants to put his agenda and your spirit and use the talents God gave you to further his kingdom. And I believe I'm looking at the best and the brightest of this part of the country right now. And so, so our society has got to get us to, to integrate. And so what they've done is they've brought us to the king's table. And our world has taken every manner of forbidden fruit. And it's arranged it. In front of us. It was easy for the Jew to say no to bacon. As long as they was cooking it down at the Gentiles farm. But it's not so easy to say no when it's on a platter right under your nose. And the question I want to ask is when you sit at the king's table. And you have opportunity. To defile your conscience without anybody else in the world knowing. What are you going to do? You're going to find out if what you believe is a preference or if it's a conviction. I want to have some conviction in my spirit. It looks ridiculous for Daniel to sit there at the king's table and eat a bowl of pulse and water while everybody else is feasting. But Daniel had convictions. He really did. Now, I want to just talk about a few things to make my point here. Uh, my pastor, years ago, years ago, he took a strong stand against television. And the standard of the church 
was that the saints did not have a television in their home. And if there was a sister that came, had an unsaved husband, her to be involved in the church, and still this way today, uh, she agreed, just don't watch it. Because uh, he taught, and rightly so, that, that Hollywood is so filthy and so evil. And there's so much, I mean, just filth in the whole industry. that The saints don't need to bring that in their home. We don't want to raise our kids and have them entertain that stuff. And so he drew a line in the sand and said, nobody have a TV. And so we didn't. It wasn't hard. It wasn't difficult. And so we had a standard of no television. Then, now this is what he taught, and I'm not trying to cross any lines or whatever. I'm just, I'm just telling you the way it was when I was younger. When, when it became popular for Pentecostals to uh, start getting a VCR and video and, and not having television, but they would rent certain innocent movies, or supposedly, he drew a line and said, for those of us in this church, we're not going to have video and we're not going to have any kind of video entertainment. He drew a line. And so while many were getting VCRs and monitors, uh, we didn't do it. And you know what? I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to have had and still have a man of God in my life that set a standard. And I'm going to tell you, when I was younger, the whole television and the entertainment thing, it was just, it was not a big issue because we had a standard. It was so, such a clean line there. We just didn't have one. We just didn't do it. It was that simple. However, times have changed. We've gotten captured by Babylon. And we've been ushered into the king's table. And you know what did it? It was internet. We didn't invent internet. Al Gore did. Not really. <laughs> Who's Al Gore? He's a, uh, he's a, he's a nut job is what he is. He's, just, he's a Democrat. <laughs> no such thing as a good Democrat. <laughs> it's, oh, hallelujah. But they got the Holy Ghost and not Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're still Democrat, we'll pray you through before this camp meeting's over. You'll be Republican. So. <laughs> so anyway, we've got Internet, and now Internet was a whole different world. In a lot of ways, we're captured because, you see, if you work a job, you have to have Internet most time. If you go to college and most kinds of schooling, you have to have internet. If you buy an airplane ticket, it's getting harder and harder to do without internet. And so internet became a necessity. A lot of preachers saw the dangers of it. And it was so easy when it was television, so they just don't have it. Because that was just entertainment and, and you just didn't have it and that's, that's okay. But now we're forced into a situation where we've got to sit at a table that we didn't make. And the confusing thing is that on this table there's a lot of good food. A lot of necessary food. Edible food. Enjoyable food. But on this king's table He's placed a lot of platters of pornography and chat rooms and online dating sites and platter after platter. And every day when we sit down at our computer, we're sitting at the king's table. We got to eat. But oh, we've got to 
choose what to eat. Now I'm going to tell you, and if, if Bishop, he, he can fix all this if I mess it up and I'm out of way in anything, brother. I'm, I'm, I need help in this. But I haven't found a way to set a standard that draws a clean line across the king's table. And I want to. I've looked for a standard, but I can't find one. Somebody says, well, get a filter. Well, that's, that's good, but. You won't have a filter everywhere. You have to get a computer. And filters don't filter everything that needs a filter. And there's ways around filters. And so I've looked for a standard, but I don't. And then, 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 I, can I just pre- talk to us a little bit? I, 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 I'm not doing a lot of preaching now. I'm just talking to us. It's something I'm dealing with as a pastor. I didn't ask to be at Babylon. I didn't ask for all this stuff to be put in front of me. Uh, We're captured. We're surrounded. And if the internet wasn't bad enough, along came the smartphones. And I remember the first smartphone I got was a Trio. Anybody remember the days of Trios? And it opened up a new world of possibility because you could get on the internet and your phone. But it didn't work very good. It was real slow. And along came the iPhone. And then come the droid. And, and with our phones, we have the capability of watching movies, watching television, downloading any kind of music that you can think of. We have the ability to take pictures, send pictures. We have the ability to do FaceTime. And so now we can have conversations with people at times of the day and night with the visuals that we never could have had before. But the deal is, I mean, I guess we could have draw on a standard in our church that we'd nobody have a cell phone but that's not reality in Memphis because we're going to have cell phones hope we can get to heaven with one but we're going to have one that's just reality and and then and then and I don't know where y'all stand on social networking and Twitter and things like that I'm not I'm not you know that but but we've got, we've got uh, social networking there. And then you've got people from all kinds of ungodly lifestyles asking to be connected to you as a friend. You've got women sending uh, uh, friend requests. Click on friend me to see my sexy photos. All my life I've never been solicited like that. Never never been to a porn shop in all my life. Not planning on going. Used to be as a seedy part of town. But now, now I've been drug into the banquet hall. And, and the platter's been set right in front of me. And brother, I've looked and looked for a standard to fix the problem. I want one. It would simplify it. It was so much more simple when it was just don't have TV. But, and, 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 and elders, if you can give me one, help me. But I haven't found one. And I've prayed and I've wrestled with this thing and I've wrestled with this thing and I've wrestled with this thing. Because I know all of our young people are sitting at King's table. I can't monitor their phone. I can't monitor every computer. I can't go with them to college. I can't, I can't do that. 
at some point they're going to be at the king's table all by themselves. I'm going to tell you somewhere along the way, you got to get this in your heart. There's got to be something in you that says there might not be a standard. There may not be a rule. But there's a principle of godliness involved. And bless your heart, brother. I don't care if everybody else is doing it. I don't care if it's at my fingertips. I've made my mind up. I will not defile myself with the king's meat. Oh, let's clap our hands. We need conviction. I want to thank you. Can be seated. And what troubles me, and I'm sure it's not this way in Canada because people are so much more godly up here. But in the states, I'm watching as one Pentecostal left church after another is folding up the tent, and there. Cutting into those bacon ripe filet mignons. And young people are going head over heels and all this stuff. So I've begun to wonder in my mind if it's going to take conviction. In, we, we cannot achieve the goal of holiness through standards alone. We're going to have to have a conviction that goes deeper than that. And I'm not knocking standards. I believe them. I love them. But if that's where it stops, and that's where it has stopped for so many places, and it did not equip them, standards did not equip them for the king's table. What was different about Daniel? That he would purpose in his heart that he would not do what all the other Hebrews and all the other churches were doing. The only difference I can find is that Daniel had this little habit he picked up. Three times a day, he'd go get in the presence of a king that was higher than Nebuchadnezzar. Three times a day, he'd get in the presence of God. And I'm going to tell you, when you get in the presence of God, the presence of God will put a spirit of holiness and purity in your heart. The presence of God will put something in you that will make you swim uphill against the downhill current. The presence of God will put something in your heart that will cause you to say no when everybody else is saying yes. The presence of God in you will put conviction in your spirit and it will keep you and preserve you. Let's all remain standing. We don't get convictions as world's going to get us. If it's just a preference, you're going to get put in a situation where your preference just going to hold up. Let's remain standing. You know, uh, I guess every young pastor, uh, you reach probably more than one crossroad in your life where you have to you have to make decisions on on direction and and uh, there comes times in our lives as ministers when our peer group we have we have friends preacher friends that have gotten tired of saying no at the king's table and they go a different direction. And they justify it. And there's times every preacher will have to feel like he's all by himself. And, um, and you know, in some ways, I, 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 I feel like I've walked and walking those uh, uh, footsteps. And, 
have that uncomfortable feeling being the only one at the table eating oatmeal when everybody else is eating the pork. But the only thing I can say, the only thing I can say to people that are wanting to go a different direction is the same thing Daniel said. Daniel said, let our diet of pulse and water be put to the test. So give us 10 days and then come back and look at us and see which ones of us look the healthiest. And you know what I say in the church? We have to decide whether we're going to go closer to the world or hold the course and what's right. Give us 10 years. That's what I'm saying right now is give me 10 years in Memphis of us taking a stand on some of these issues and holding to some of these things. Just give us 10 years. Then you come to our church and then you visit their church and see what you feel. So I'm going to tell you what we got in our church at home. We have the glory cloud coming by pretty regular. And I sort of like it that way. Every now and then the Holy Ghost comes down and, and just shakes it up. And I like it that way. And I'm afraid of starting to eat all those things and getting my conscience defiled and becoming like the world because I'm afraid God would leave me all by myself to have church. I'm afraid we become empty and hollow and there'd come a day when there's no glory. Give me 10 years and see if the glory stays with us. And... Uh, and go see if it stayed with the people that uh, defiled themselves. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost. Let's lift our hands. I would just need to feel after the Lord for a few minutes. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want us to come join around the front standing and lifting our hands and just asking the Lord, God, I want your holy presence to bring this truth down deeper in my spirit as conviction. Oh, God. Hallelujah. 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 Shaya la la da sataya. Oh God. Hallelujah. Oh God, raise up young men of conviction. Jesus, Jesus, Hallelujah, <coughs> Hallelujah, my God, my God, my God, my God, Eli, Satire. Five invalid arguments concerning baptism. One, I don't need baptism because I trusted Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Mark 16 and 16. In John 6, 29, Jesus said faith was a work. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. James 2, 26 says, 
For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We see in 1 John 3.18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So, not getting baptized into Jesus Christ is to disbelieve Him. Paul connected faith and baptism. For you are all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26-27 2. The thief on the cross was forgiven and didn't need to be baptized, so neither do I. First, nobody can say if he was baptized. That's unknown. The thief died in the Old Testament, and Jesus had power to forgive sins. Before his death, Jesus directly granted forgiveness to some people. Mark 2, 5 through 12, Luke 7, 48 through 49, John 8, 1 through 11. The thief is just another such case. Second, and more importantly, baptism was not even instituted into the New Testament. Salvation in the name of Jesus is based upon his death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 7. Jesus did not give the great commission of Mark 16, 15 through 17 and Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which re requires baptism until much later. 3. Some, in wishing to deny the importance and purpose of baptism, claim that the original Greek word, EIS, which is found 1,750 times in Acts 2.38, means to be baptized because you have already receive remission or forgiveness of sins. In Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said his blood is shed for many for the remission of sins. Did Jesus shed his blood because people already had forgiveness or in order that they might obtain it? For the last several centuries, English speakers have exclusively seen EIS as looking forward and never backward. At least 40 translations say of Acts 2.38, is for the forgiveness of sins. Why change it now to suit those who just want to deny the gospel of God? Colossians 2 and 8. 4. Calling upon the name of the Lord alone saves me. Romans 10, 8 through 13. If that's true, why did Peter, who already preached to the 3,000 repenting Jews that calling on the name of the Lord saves and acts, 2.21 still requires baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul fasted, prayed, and yet was ordered to get baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus to wash away his sins by water baptism in Acts 22.16. Why? Because they both knew that everyone must call upon the name of the Lord Jesus in all things. Colossians 3.17 And that baptism does also now save us. 1 Peter 3. 21. Paul mentions that baptism in Jesus' name gets us into Christ in Romans 6, 3-5, written in 66 AD. Therefore, we must use his name in our baptism. Salvation began in the book of Acts on 33 AD. Not later. Paul always baptized in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of sins as in Acts 16, 15 through 33, 18, 8, 19, 5. We must properly understand and study the scriptures. 2 Peter 3, 16, 2 Timothy 2, 15, 5. The sinner's prayer, invented and made popular by the likes of Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, and Billy Bright, saves me. Well, those guys were not the first to challenge the gospel message, Galatians 1, 6 through 12. In 1523, Ulrich Zwingli, 1484 to 1531, proclaimed that Jesus, the apostles, and the church fathers were in error. He even contradicted Jesus, calling him a liar, saying things like, Christ himself did not connect salvation with baptism. Yet Jesus said in Mark 16 and 16, believers get baptized. Zwingli said, Water baptism cannot contribute in any way to the washing away of sin. That contradicts the direct words of the apostles and God's man who told Paul to wash away his sins by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus in Acts 22.16. The sinner's prayer is a work that came about by Dwight 
Moody, 1837 to 1899. He modified a system, and it became known as the Sinner's Prayer, becoming popular first under Billy Sunday, then later adopted by Baptist preachers, and even Billy Graham. It replaced Jesus and the Apostles' word on salvation, Ephesians 2.20. Will you trust in God or man? We ought to obey God rather than man. God is the judge and not anyone else. Revelations 22, 18 through 19, Matthew 4 and 4. Have faith in God and his word. John 1, 1 through 14. Not some man-made salvation formula that saves nobody. I pray today that God's word will find its place in your heart and life. May you hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you for watching. God bless.